Thank you. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to this Institute of Molecular Science and Engineering's uh, briefing paper launch uh, addressing plastic additives. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you all here as well as everyone that is uh, watching online at the moment. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jose Jimenez. I'm reader in the Department of Life Sciences here at Imperial College London. Uh, in a field called synthetic biology that has a bit to do with the things that we are going to discuss today. And uh, today, um, we are going to delve into the complex world of, and, and oftentimes, nasty world of plastic additives. So we are going to learn about uh, what are their implications for our health, for the environment, as well as for the recycling industry. So in this age, um, I guess that I don't have to convince you that we are using plastics probably too much. Uh, they're present continuously in our daily lives. And of course, it's of extreme importance to, to learn about these hidden components um, that, we con that we call plastic additives. So uh, this briefing paper is an extensive and thorough review about these additives and in particular looking at, as I said, the implications for, for health and the environment, but very importantly, it also discusses what are the regulations that are around uh, these additives and what are the regulatory challenges as well. So before I move on, I wanted to introduce the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering. So this is one of the global institutes at Imperial, and it draws its force from the four faculties at college um, in order to address uh, complex challenges that the world is facing today. Uh, some of these global uh, problems can be solved through uh, the main focus of the activities of BMC, which are anything that have to do with molecular innovation. So um, one of the very good things that IMSI does, and one of the affiliates, is that it brings together uh, people with very different expertise and backgrounds. And we think that this type of interdisciplinary research is essential for being able to tackle all these problems. Okay, so today, now, we are going to uh, move on and hear a presentation from Professor Jason Hallett. Um, uh, professor Hallett is Professor of um, chem Sustainable Chemical Technology at the Department of Chemical Engineering here at Imperial College, and he's one of the co-authors of the key policy recommendations. Uh, after the presentation, we'll go on, on, on a panel discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it to Jason. Thank you. Thank you for the awesome. Welcome, everyone. Well, this, is, this is great. So. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Okay. <laughs> That's just my natural magnetic personality. It's my... um, so I'm going to take you through the uh, recommendation, or the key recommendations that we have uh, made, which you've all got the briefing document in front of you. Um, what briefing documents is too. Very exciting. Um, I'd like to start, of course, by scaring everyone. This is mandatory. I mean, I've been giving talks on plastic recycling for, I don't know, six or seven years now. And you have to start with scary stuff. Um, I'm told it's a problem. And apparently this is well known. Um, it, actually, we, we've been working on this here at Imperial, we've been working on this uh, plastic waste problem it's, it's, since it's, even before it's, David Attenborough uh, used to this. Um, it, it, it is uh, a problem we should have seen coming, and uh, I, I'm a chemical engineer. I often joke, <coughs> or I used to say with seriousness, and I still think it's true, but um, chemical engineer's greatest contribution to society is that we basically invented it. This was our fault. So all the plastics, this is our fault. So we caused this problem. And you can see the growth of, of plastic production, which I... I said earlier that we should have seen this coming. I mean, the growth is absolutely yeah, so we made an So we made a virtually indestructible material, and then we ramped up production from one and a half million tons a year to just under 400 million tons a year in half a century. And of course, integrate that curve. 70% of the material in there is still out there. So there's an absolutely scale amount of waste plastic. It's three and a half billion plastic waste floating around the planet somewhere. It's not all in the environment. Um, this briefing paper is not about plastic waste itself. We were talking here about the additives in plastic waste. And 
there are a lot of things that are meant by additives. Well, I'll try, you know, I've given some concrete examples here, but I do the pictorial representation in a moment. Some of them are functional. Of course, the most obvious one is the plasticizers. And you turn a polymer into a plastic, we usually have to add some material to get flexibility. Um, colorants, so dyes, it's a topic near and dear to my heart for, for a number of reasons, but often plastic waste is colored. And so we've added dyes into the material. Fillers that are used a lot in order more or less to change the porosity or to, to change the density of the material. We have reinforcement, so carbon fiber composites. That's Aggie's domain, so it's her fault if the carbon fibers are a problem. But um, often we have these composite materials of fibers with plastic. Plastic is usually the continuum of those composites. And the final thing that's up there is sort of stuff that got in there by accident. So other things, you know, anything from you know, dirt and contaminants to stuff that was in there when you did the uh, processing, the cross processing when it got thrown away or when it got chewed up. And I think this is important because it's a wide variety of materials, some of which are well characterized and we know what they are, others of which are extremely random, I guess you could say, because they were picked up in the environment. There's a lot of regulation that goes on with additives in plastic packaging, quite famously around plasticizers, several of which have, I don't know, either been banned or have failed to go through legislation. <laughs> Because normally, because of the toxicity, um, I think probably the most obvious one is DOP, which is an endocrine disruptor. And so a lot of these sorts of plasticizers are being phased out and replaced with other things. Part of the reason that these additives are an issue is because they impact recycling. So this is where I start quizzing the audience. Does anyone know what the global rate of plastic recycling is? What was that? Almost perfect. Almost perfect. Yes, what? 8.7. Not bad, though. So in between 7 and 12. So if you average it together, you've got it. 8.7%. So we're pretty good. Percent. <laughs> the theoretical maximum is 85%, incidentally. This is what scientists believe is the most you could recycle. Above that, the entropy is good money. So. 85% is about what we think is achievable. So we're a tenth of the way there. Well done us. One of the biggest factors that limits our current recycling technology is that we have to deal with plastics in the product that, that they exist. Um, I get into a lot of trouble at Plastic Recycling. Like I was at the Gordon Conference recently and they, they almost blew me off the stage. But I asked a simple question, why is everybody work on PET all the time? So plastic bottles, as far as I'm aware, are the only single plastic material out there. Even they have got all of these additives in them, but at least they don't have another column. So we did a project here in Imperial a few years ago that ran, as far as I can tell, forever on multi-layer plastic packaging. And I've shown a picture up there of what exactly is involved in the 7 to 11 layers that make up a crisp packet. Um, it contains usually five different polymers, um, including the glues, so the polyurethane glues that hold together. Metals, they're usually there as an oxygen barrier. Uh, again, plasticizers that are there to give the flexibility. Sometimes the cellulose that's in there to protect the food from the metals that we put in there to protect the food from the oxygen. So, you get the idea. So we keep adding more and more things and making it more and more complex. You look at a crisp packet, it doesn't look all that offensive, but actually it is. The worst one's a Kit Kat wrapper because of the wafers. Apparently those have to have 12 different layers. Absolutely scary. So is it a shock that we can't recycle this? No. And it's not the polymer that's the problem. The polymers in those lovely crisp packets would be perfectly easy to recycle if we could get all the garbage away from them. The other one, I mentioned dyes and colorants. So on the top there, I've shown bags of plastic uh, textiles. textiles. So my second quiz, does anyone know what the global recycling rate for textiles is? This does include cotton and polyester. It's a little less than 1%, yes, about 0.7%. 
we're really good on that one. Yeah. Um, the only material I'm aware of that we recycle at a high rate is PET bottles, as I mentioned, the model material. Almost all, I can't remember the exact percentage, but almost all PET bottle recycling is recycling bottles into textiles. So there's actually a lot of clothing that contains recycled plastic, but that's because it's recycled bottles into textiles, not recycled textiles into textiles. So it is a cascading recycling system, even when we get it right. We're dropping it down, not pushing it. The big problem with textile recycling is the dyes. So the reason that textiles are virtually impossible to recycle is because of the dyes. When you melt polyester that's dyed, the dyes decompose. Either off-gassing toxic chemicals or just turning it an ugly dark brown color. Either way, it's a big problem. And so the only textile recycling that in that 0.7% is black fibers, because the only thing you can do with the nasty brown recycled PET is dye it until it's black. So, that's me scaring you. What did we say in the briefing document? We gave some key findings and recommendations, I guess, for, for policy can do to help make these intractable problems tractable. Um, one of the scariest bits we're looking into this is exactly what the range is of things that we add into plastics. There's no real standardization, there's no real regulation around what goes into a consumer product. Um, as long as it's not gonna kill people, basically all bets are off. And so our first, and I think, at least in my opinion, strongest recommendation is to try and reduce the range. It's very hard to design a holistic recycling system when you might have thousands of different components in there. Trying to get that down to something manageable will be a big deal. Um, we have incidentally done this in a couple of industries, one of which is coloring of textiles. We don't do this with other types of plastics or packaging. You can use almost anything, but in textiles, they really only use 12 dyes virtually. That's not too bad. You can handle 12. The sustainability assessment. So at the moment, even when people do talk about sustainability in plastics or the impact of recycling on performance. Again, there's very little standardization about this. So some guidelines, some benchmarks for what exactly is and isn't allowed and what exactly should and shouldn't be our targets in this area. we we'll go a long ways for designing better systems in the recycling. Obviously, academics can't possibly make any recommendations that don't include giving us more funding. But I do think that this is an area where we really don't have infrastructure that's capable of dealing with the problem. We do need new technologies. I mean, we're crying out for new sorting technologies all the time. That's just to deal with the input materials into the existing system. We want to broaden the scope of what we can recycle and push that 8% up to you know, 20, wouldn't that be nice? Much less 50 or 70 or 80. So we're going to have to have new technologies that can deal with materials that right now we are incapable of recycling. And finally, uh, it may or may not happen anyway, but I think it's an important recommendation. This is a global industry. And if the UK has different regulations to the rest of our market, it's going to be very difficult to homogenize recycling systems. And so we do need some way aligning the UK and at least the European um, standards in this area. Otherwise, we're going to be importing products that don't fit into the system that we develop here for our domestic products. And the last thing we want is to have to start sorting our recycling products by origin. That would be a bit of a nightmare. I believe that that is the end of my recommendations. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice thing. So we are going to now move on to the panel discussion. If if you don't mind taking your first stage, brilliant. Yeah, just a bit of housekeeping uh, before we move on. Uh, we will have a Q and A session, a Q and A portion at the end. Uh, after the panel discussion. So uh, for those of you here in the room, uh, please save your questions until 
until the end. And for those of you watching online, uh, please type the questions in the comments section that you have on the web, and then someone from the INSI team will read them loud when we get to the Q&A portion. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll move on now to the panel discussion, as I said, and we're going to start by introducing the different members of the panel. Um, I'll start with myself, and then if you don't mind, we'll go around the table. Uh, as I said, my name is Jose Jimenez. I'm reading in synthetic biology, and I have an interest in using uh, enzymes and microorganisms for managing plastic waste, and hopefully including additives. Um, we think that there are uh, some advantages for doing this, um, which uh, include the fact that uh, complex waste streams uh, might be something that enzymes can deal with, even while other recycling technologies might not be able to do it. Um, you know, Professor Hallett? Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Jason Hallett. of plastic packaging and also textiles, a great form of textile recycling. And I was the PI on our Greener Plastics Future program, which was a college-wide plastic recycling program for what felt like about 30 years, but was actually only three. Victor? Yes. Um, my background is a student here at Imperial uh, five, six years ago in the Environmental Engineering School. Um, started a PhD as well. I did a very brief stint working for Goldman Sachs, only to then start a company, Recycli, where we specialize in developing AI-based vision systems that scan waste and identify all the different material streams in household waste facilities, and then we have robotic systems uh, that sort them out. Uh, and today we're a company uh, based out of London. Uh, it's about 50 of us and, and starting to expand across Europe. Uh, deploying our sorting machines and very passionate about this subject because obviously all the challenging things we see uh, essentially our life would be a lot easier if there's a bit more standardization because the big challenge today is, is as Jason mentioned we're dealing with thousands of different polymers and different items um, and obviously you can't have one machine for, for each one of them. Um, hi, uh, I'm Aggie Brand Tolbert. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry here at Imperial and my research interest is also in the chemical recycling of plastics. And we're also just starting a project on multi-layer packaging. So what Jason mentioned is these, you know, the, uh, increasing the recyclability of the multi-layers, um, including so polymers and... Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you very much all. So uh, to get started with... The um, I wanted to ask something about the first of your policy recommendations, which has to do with the regulations. So I'm not sure who wants to take it, but basically uh, I'd love to know, we'd love to know uh, what are the EU recommendations in this regard, because it feels one of the other um, things that, that you recommended was that the UK should perhaps align with them. So uh, in particular, what are... Um, recommendation of what we should be looking at trying to restrict these uh, families of additives. So maybe I can start. So generally, yeah. I think we it's quite early that um, I think that, that not many people have thought about the additives. So generally, it's about thing. Yeah, I think there's basically a lack of awareness. I think maybe the first step of these briefing papers is to um, just to raise awareness. And um, yeah, I think the EU has probably not said that much on, on, on the additives yet. Uh, but things, the discussions that have been around, for example, not including BPA in bottles, etc. cetera. Um, can you envision something along those lines? like? additives that are currently being used for bulk chemicals that maybe could be, uh, we could replace by others? Um, yeah, so I think maybe in, in certain points there have been, so the plasticizers, that's already been a discussion for, for decades now, but I think, for example, the colors and um, um, yeah, the multi-layer packaging, I think that has just started, people have just re started realizing um, that it's a problem. The EU has recently drafted these regulations, for instance, on what can and can't go into consumer products. Only in terms of whether or not it's biodegradable. At the moment, there's... What, am I not on? Oh, there's a thing. Oh, my word. Okay, good. 
Uh, so at the moment, for instance, if you take a, a bottle of detergent, a bottle of shampoo, the surfactant has to be biodegradable by law, but none of the additives. Mm -hmm. And this is because, of course, shampoo goes into wastewater treatment, so we need it to, to uh, digest um, in the, um, inside the wastewater treatment plant. But we never think about the additives. And so at the moment, we're sort of, or the EU at least, is sort of looking at the higher level questions, but they haven't yet, as Aggie said, they haven't really yet come down to the, to the next bit. I think what we were afraid of here is that we were going to, or the UK would come up with a set of regulations and you know a list maybe of things that were allowed to be used. And then you get a different list in the EU and you get a different list in the US, but we ship products all over the world. And so on the front end, you might have a very well-regulated, well-set-up system but the recycling has to take in whatever comes into the stream, and those products might have been manufactured anywhere. My view is that there's a, f a few things we can already do now that will have an enormous difference, um, mainly the dyes. Today, take any plastic you have, if there's a color, chances are probably 100% that it will not get recycled. Um, and the simple reason is, Te technically, every, yeah, everything is recyclable, just not economically recyclable. And, and the way a waste facility works is today you, you have essentially all your mixed material coming in, and then you're going to have a machine that's going to extract each type of material, and you know, conveyor belt after conveyor belt. Um, basically, the only way we could do that is you would need one, say, take PT, for example. Today, very easy, 80% of the PT is transparent. You have one machine, extract them all. Um, some countries take a bit of PT blue. And we have endless theoretical debates with our customers of where the line between blue and transparent is. Um, and those are okay because you can have a lot of PT blue, but if you have PT green, that's never cost effective to sort. If you have something red, any other color, you're just going to mix it. And the price today of mixed colored plastics is less than half what it is of the clear plastic because uh, obviously you, you can maybe make flower pots, and so it's again downgrading. Uh, and some people are doing it. So, so Sprite, for example, you might remember sort of five years ago, all their bottles in the UK were green. They actually took it upon themselves to change them to transparent, and that basically means that overnight, one of the biggest brands in the world went from all of their bottles not being recycled to suddenly being recycled. Uh, and so yeah, I think simple things like that could already be implemented and, and have a massive impact. Yeah, we've, we've seen this as well. And uh, supermarket brands have told us that they're simplifying their plastics, not necessarily the additives. And so that inspired us. And um, it's really nice to see that there are players that take it upon themselves. But we, we are worried that um, just um, voluntary action is not enough and that we need sort of an intervention by, by policy, basically, and on our national and ideally a glo global level to really uh, make this consistent, uh, consistently work basically and, and increase the recycling rates um, everywhere. Um, I think mine is working. Another point I wanted to, to touch upon is uh, what do you think of the quality of the final product? So can all additives be replaced or removed? Uh, or is it possible, or we will always have to keep some, like for example, the flame retardants, some plasticizers, etc. Don't worry, let me take this. Okay, uh, and it's a good question. Uh, there are some things that we have to do for product safety, right? And the the reason that we here at Imperial, the reason that we went after multi-layer plastic packaging is because this is the more difficult end of food packaging, where first and foremost performance uh, above all else and of course, engineers, we always say performance is the most important thing, but nobody wants to eat rotten food. This is sort of a thing. And there was a big question that we asked at one point, which was, okay, how far are we willing to go with this? And I mentioned, the reason I mentioned the crisp packet and how complicated it is, this is, this is all done. These, set, these five different polymers, these seven or ten different layers, is done so that the crisps aren't soggy. That's basically it. This is so we don't have to eat soggy crisps. And... I guess, I guess, you know, how many of these additives do we need in order to take to add functionality to protect us from food spoilage versus how much do we need in order to, you know, add, make it a little bit crisper or make it a little bit more universal. Um, one of the scariest things that, that we learned during that project from one of the global food companies, I won't mention who, but um, they have one set of um, specs for their packaging. So the food has to be able to keep, to keep fresh in the north of Sweden and in the middle of Vietnam. 
because they don't want to have different types of packaging for different regions. And so the specifications on some of these products are absolutely insanely over the top because they have to be able to reach an enormous range of temperature and humidity and everything and have the same shelf life. Um, and so one of sort of the uh, corollaries of that is how far are we willing to push industry to de-streamline some of their processes um, so that we can have a trade-off between cost and environmental damage. Anyone want to add to that? No? no? I'll take the shot. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Uh, something related to just let, uh, what you just said. Um, is, would it be fair then for producers to carry all the cost uh, of these technology developments because it feels like uh, it benefits consumers and it certainly benefits recyclers um, so the distribution of these uh, innovations might be a bit unfair to the producers. I give perhaps not the answer that you expect and actually challenge it, whereby I do think there's also value in keeping it all the same and actually having the same packaging in North, in Vietnam than in Sweden helps. Um, again, coming back down to that standardization. Um, the more varieties you have, the harder it is. I think Take any material in the world, if you have enough of quantity of it, and if you can agglomerate enough of it, somebody, you'll find a buyer and an end user to purchase it from you. So it's just finding a process that's cheap enough and that fuels innovation and people will find it. Um, the main thing is in the waste industry, you work sort of on building a waste plant. It's got about a 20 year lifespan. So when you build your waste plant, you, want to, you don't really want your waste to change. Uh, and that adds costs. A lot of waste plants were built, for example, 40 years ago, assuming 20, 30% of newspaper. Now they're below capacity, they need massive retrofits. Uh, one of the biggest things that would really help the waste industry is just constant packaging that doesn't change. And then yes, innovation will come and we will develop machines that can sort them, but if it changes all the time, that makes it a lot more complicated. Um, one particular example that's a, a very sort of hot debate at the moment is, is bioplastics likewise, which have been branded as this wonderful thing and I'm sure as consumers, we all love it. We sell our machines to lots of waste plants and composting plants all of them hate bioplastics. The waste plants, what would they want a nice PET if now you give them some crap that's gonna degrade? Well, not great, they're not gonna have a good quality material. Uh, likewise, even the composting plants, a lot of these bioplastics are industrial composting. They basically degrade way, way slower than the normal plastic, so they're somewhere looking at purchasing some of our robots to actually sort it out because it just doesn't degrade as well. Um, but, but it's a tricky balance, I guess, between having more of a, almost a dictatorship that sort of tells everyone exactly what type of packaging and you cannot change, um, while it's also enabling innovation. Because yeah, maybe you know, research at Imperial will yield suddenly a, a new wonder material and actually could make the whole process better. And then you want to sort of leapfrog to that new process, but it's, I suppose, that intermediate period where you have this minority material that's entering a stream, so nobody's really paying attention to it, so it probably doesn't really get recycled to having something that's generally really economically to recycle, but you need to build, essentially, you, the risk is not thinking just of the packaging, but always about the network and the infrastructure we have for all of that connect, collection, and, and that there's just a lag in adapting the, the infrastructure to the packaging, and, and it's finding that right balance. That's, uh, I think, one of the biggest challenges in, in sort of balancing that approach and, and the speed in which you want to apply those regulations. Um, yeah, we should remember that waste management costs money, right? We're all paying that, and that's not the end producer. We're paying that with our council bills and so on. And so, having a you know very efficient <coughs> waste management system will will save costs for society as well. And we see that in countries that aren't as wealthy. That the reason why they, I'm sure they like a clean environment as well, but like they just don't necessarily have the money in for building the infrastructure and collecting and sorting the waste like us. So. I think making it a simple system should help with you know, rolling it out across the world quick, as quickly as possible as the plastic waste builds up every year. Actually, Victor said something that, that reminded me. I mean, w one of the things that, that we battle in this with standardization is marketing. And this, this is always a problem. Um, I'm always reminded of the Canadian beer bottles, which is, which is a great, it's always wonderful to think about beer. But um, they come in two types brown bottles and green bottles. And they're all exactly the same. It doesn't matter which brewery it is. They all use the exact same bottle shape, and then they put their label on. So the bottle's the same. You do not see that with plastic bottles. 
they're all different shapes because the marketing has been set up to make it more identifiable with that brand. So part of the branding went into the shape of the product. And that, of course, means that you can't, you have to, you have to go through quite extensive um, melt reprocessing. You can't just do refilling with plastic bottles, which you can do with glass bottles. I'm not necessarily saying that we, that we you know, there, there are, there are, that will fix all of the challenges because, of course, it's a very limited scope. But it is an example of where sort of a recycling system was put in place, I guess you could say with a bit of common sense around how to tackle the shape of the product rather than just letting everybody do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've touched upon the um, different uh, recycling infrastructures that might be available depending on the country, etc. Uh, I've been working on this for a number of years now, and a question that keeps coming up is what gets actually recycled and what doesn't. Um, so containers, I think we have all the view of the pet bottles, etc. Uh, and I think those are collected and recycled to a very big extent. Uh, films and other types of plastics, not so much, right? So um, we are looking into making smarter plastics, but also be great to increase the amount of plastic that can actually be recycled. So I don't know if you could comment on that. Yeah, yeah. films are, today I guess they're, they're the hot topic in the industry at the moment. Um, but it's not going well. You, you, Tesco started collecting them uh, for, for the past two years uh, with a company based in Scotland. Uh, turns out that company's now gone bust because they just collected the films, didn't really have any way to disposing them, so it just accumulated in a warehouse and they couldn't pay the lease fees for it anymore. And so it was just this massive warehouse. So we collected the films, but we don't have an outlet for it yet. Um, yeah, all the, the best one I love is yeah, I, I, with, with Jason on this one, that, that PET is, is my favorite uh, of all plastics. It, it gets recycled really well. Um, then there's all the colors we, we can ignore. Uh, these, these just get downgraded. And, and then a little known one is all your PE and PP um, have a major problem. And the major problem in those is food versus non-food grade. So today, if you have, the reason PET bottles are so widely recycled is on, on the market, 90% of them are sort of contain water or, or liquid. Um, but if say 90% of them were shampoo bottles, uh, we couldn't make new um, drinks bottles. Because if you have a shampoo bottle, you're not allowed to make a drink bottle afterwards uh, because you essentially, you have toxicity added to it. Uh, but for PET, it's fine because there's just so many drinks bottles. And so yeah, there's a little bit, but it gets diluted. Um, for PE, so think all your milk bottles and your pots and all of those basically get collected, but will never, it will never be bottle to bottle again. With the only exception, you can be proud of the UK. The UK is the only country in the world that actually does this, um, simply because we seem to be drinking a lot of milk and we also seem to be the only country that drinks milk fast, whereby in the UK, the milk bottles are these sort of trans, a bit translucent bottles. Um, all other countries don't have that because it does reduce the shelf life, but it seems we drink it fast, so we don't need a very long shelf life. But if you go to France or the rest of Europe, they're typically white and will sometimes even have a carbon coating inside. Um, and so actually the UK is the only country in the world that does recycle bottle to bottle of milk bottles, which is fantastic because it proves they can be done. It, you just need to sort of standardize it. And today, yeah, a lot of machines struggle in identifying those food, non-food grades. Uh, that's something I recycle, like we're working on to, to identify the those materials and we're starting to sort them and we've just achieved really good results actually in sorting them. Uh, but now we need sort of regulatory approval and that's gonna take a very long time uh, to get there. Uh, so that's just one example, uh, I guess, of, uh, of what gets recycled. And then aluminium gets recycled very well. And, and that's only within household waste. And so um, I, I'm not, yeah, then there's all the other plastic applications. Uh, but yeah, today household waste is probably the, the widest use of plastics. Great, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, I wanted to ask more specifically about the additives, which are the main topic of this um, um, discussion. So, um, I wondered, you know, uh, you mentioned that the additives, in order to be allowed, some of them need to be biodegradable, but my guess is that not all of them are, so to what extent their environmental fate is known, or if we can <laughs> classify them according to different families because of their biodegradability? Actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. No, no, to a large extent, this is not known. I mean, for the individual compounds, we, we know it. Um, what, what we've struggled with, I think, is the link between their, their fate, so the environmental leakage rate, I guess, and the degradability. A lot of them are. 
mm. biodegradable, right? Most plasticizers will, will biodegrade quite readily. Dyes generally don't. Um, in fact, dyes are quite usually quite potent um, microbial toxins, so, so generally they go the other way. Um, and so it is, it is a spectrum, I think, within that. And some products, you know, the, the bigger issue is that they get into the environment at all, so back to the endocrine disruptors, so a lot of plasticizers cause a lot of health problems. Um, a lot of them are, what do you call it, aquatic, tox aquatic toxins, and so this is why one of the reasons that the ocean waste um, is such an issue is that the additives leach out into the, into the ocean and kill all the wonderful sea life that's out there. Um, but I, I, I guess the, the bigger problem there is that there is very little regulation on that because uh, apart from consumer products, none of these things are supposed to go out, right? So we're supposed to be collecting them and incinerating them or landfilling them or whatever sorting and recycling that we can do. Um, and so the leakage, the unintended leakage, um, is a much bigger issue because those materials do end up in the environment and they weren't designed to. I actually think we do a reasonably good job with the things that we, we plan to emit. I guess you could say agrochemicals is another good example. Um, and there's a lot of, it's one place where biodegradable plastics really have, have taken off, of course, is in, is in environmental materials. Um, so, so things that we intend to stick out in a field and leave it there. Um, but it's the, it's the stuff that, that, that we, you know, it's the litter that we didn't intend um, that causes most of the problems. Right. I mean, maybe just to add to this, so yeah, if you have a biodegradable plastic, you need to definitely make sure that the additives are also biodegradable and environmentally benign, otherwise, um, yeah, you're, you're making basically a re release system on purpose of releasing toxic or persistent uh, chemicals, so that, that's really important that that's taken into account when designing these, these new plastics. But the fact that we see these uh, additives accumulating in all sorts of tissues means that they're not really, they don't biodegrade very fast, or not fast enough at least, does it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily also sort of direct toxicity. I think the, the first paper talks about that, that mm -hmm. some substances aren't necessarily very toxic, but they just don't degrade and they accumulate in certain places. And we don't know yet because they haven't been around for a long time. And the con the concentration, the amounts are still building up what it will do. And also, uh, the paper also talks about multiple of these compounds building up at the same time. And again, that hasn't been investigated or modeled, and we don't know what that will will do to the liver or the fish or the breast milk. So where it sort of like right. occurs. And I think, again, you can employ common sense here with the additives. You can take a similar approach that we do with the plastics. And, you know, I can't... Uh, there are lots of reasons why you might not want a plastic to biodegrade, well, ap apart from the recyclability issue, which, which is separate. I can't think of a reason why you would want something not to be recyclable. I can't think of a reason why you would want something not to be industrially compostable. Uh, I, 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 honestly, I can't, I can't think of any logic of why you would want something to survive under those conditions, and I can't think of any reason why you would want to make a material that you couldn't recycle. There are plenty of reasons to have a range of materials and potentially a range of additives that either are or aren't biodegradable. How we deploy those, I think, uh, in, a, in a smarter fashion is quite important. Um, and matching them up and using the non-biodegradable materials in, only in situations where we have to have materials that don't biodegrade, I think is quite important. Um, but the recyclability, first and foremost, should take precedence. And if we are putting materials out into the market because they are biodegradable, but they aren't recyclable, we are kind of trading one problem for another and potentially creating an additional one by messing up the recycling system. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question about the toxicity of, 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 toxicity of families of additives. Uh, there is something that's covered, I think, in the briefing paper. Uh, and I found very cheeky that when some of these uh, molecules get forbidden, uh, then they are replaced with pretty much a, a relative, a molecule with almost the same structure, maybe with an extra carbon. Um, and I wanted to you know the problem, I think one of the problems that are discussed in the briefing paper actually, is that the, the, um, the assessment of the toxicity of these molecules is done one by one on a case by case scenario. Uh, and I wonder if it'd be possible, or what are your thoughts about trying to assess the toxicity of all families now these days that we have AI, machine learning, and other methods to try to come up with or different strategies to, to do this? 
It's a great, it's a great question, I have to say, Jose. I, I, what, I, what I can tell you is that b the reason that bio... <coughs> sorry. The reason that toxicity um, testing is done on a case-by-case -case basis is because it's traditionally been very hard to predict. So the, the traditional structure property relationship, you add a carbon here, what happens? Actually a lot. So to toxicity is, is actually um, a function of many different things. Well, you're, <laughs> you'll know this better than I do, but it's actually a function of a lot of different processes that go on. Um, and so I guess the straightforward chemical relationship really is quite difficult to tease out. Um, biodegradability is a little bit easier, but it's still quite challenging. Whether or not machine learning and AI tools will magically make all of this obsolete, I, I, I don't know. It's a great know. question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. It, it might work well, but you might also sort of penalize or forbid like a compound that might be okay because, you know, that one change that you do in a certain place means that it degrades very differently and it behaves very different in the, in the liver. Um, yeah. So I'm not an expert in this, but I, I'd worry that you might, maybe you ha have to then, you know, forbid a family and then like... Uh, allow the outlier after testing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's an interesting problem. Yeah, most of the regulation seems to follow the, um, you know, react to the problem rather than try to prevent it. So that's uh, perhaps one of the challenges as well. Okay, um, I wanted to ask a final question from me. Um, so, if you have, if you had to give an example of one formulation that should be absolutely banned, never used, uh, which one would that be? <laughs> heavy metals in food packaging. I honestly, I, I we, this do we is, use heavy metals? In food it, we, we do. Oh, uh, wow. Aluminium and nickel <laughs> are used in a lot of food packaging. Ah, that's the white coat. Yeah, because yeah. they work well. Um, I first of all, it, it renders a lot of packaging material completely unrecyclable because when you melt it down the plastic, you then get gray particles of metal dispersed throughout the plastic. So now, what are you going to do with it, right? Um, and so that is a huge problem, and that would be quite an easy function to replace. It may be more expensive to replace it with something else, but honestly, why we put highly toxic materials into food packaging is beyond me. Yeah, hard, hard to tell. I, I think my ideal scenario is that we just start looking at waste facilities, and they all have what's this residue line, you know, all the stuff that the waste facility didn't think was valuable, and that's basically the line where you see all the terrible stuff that has no value. Your multi-layer ends up on there, your colored plastics end up on there, and, and just, yeah, have a look, read the brands, and tax all the companies that end up on those lines and their products more than the other ones. And, and that is somewhat what's starting to happen with extended producer responsibility and sort of producer pace. Um, and then I think that's the perfect incentive of, you know, if your product is designed for that infrastructure, great, you pay less, and if it's not, you pay more. Or, or invest in then fixing your, your product design. Yeah, I was gonna say black, black plastic, because I, th I think that the current sort of optical message just can't, can't deal with it. They can't see what it is. No, we can. Oh, you can, okay. Okay, then that's fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, and I think we should probably now open the, um, the session to questions from the audience. We have one at the back. So something that I, yeah, I wanted to remind you, please wait until having a, a microphone uh, so that everyone can hear the question, including the people watching from home. Oh, yeah. hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm Janet from Plastics Rebellion. You probably can gather that we're um, worried about plastics and the impacts on human health. I just wanted to say, Jason, um, you didn't see it coming. I saw it coming when I was 10, when I used to burn crisp packets in my back garden. And just my gut, my eyes, my nose, my ears told me that this was going to be a big problem. And I asked my mum, what happens to these moose pots and these crisp bags? And she said, we bury them. So I buried some, and guess what? <laughs> They're probably still there. I dug them up quite often. But anyway, that's not my question. Uh, this is my question. I've got it written down. Oh, and by the way, um, I, I can't remember your name next to Jason. I disagree with you. I think we have to be absolutely Maoist about single-use packaging. I think it's, it's, it's too much of a problem to be like, hey, we don't want to be uh, a bit 
nanny state about this. I think, you know, it, it needs big daddy even more than nanny. But anyway, um, my question is this. Sorry, and I, it was very difficult to get this question short, so do bear with me. <laughs> I apologise. Um, how far are you prepared to admit that the recycling project of retrofit circularity onto plastics isn't working? That we are all guinea pigs in uncharted territory, that the notion of disposability itself needs challenging, and that reducing needs to be one of your recommendations? Second part of the question... This is the elephant in the room, isn't it? It would be great to have clear, simple additives regulation, but isn't the major thing that no one is talking about is that many single-use plastics need to be massively reduced or phased out entirely and reuse schemes developed instead? Yeah, good. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an opinion first. You know, Victor, Victor can give you, a, I think, a, 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 a wider view on this. Um, uh, and also, I will say, first of all, to, to address your comment about my comment, but, but however that works about, about burying things. Actually, I think by and large, if we were better at burying plastic, so if we did a better job of collection in landfill and had less leakage, that would, solve, that would be the biggest thing we could do to solve this problem. Um, the, the, the biggest problem with plastics in the... The biggest problems with plastics in the environment is that they're in the environment, <laughs> is what I'm saying. So if we did a better job of controlling um, the stream, um, that would go a long ways towards increasing, first of all, recyclability, and second of all, reducing the impact on human health. I don't mean literally burying. I mean, I mean uh, sequestering. There you go. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think anything in this briefing paper was meant to suggest that we shouldn't be following sort of the hierarchy of, of reuse and, 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 and reduce. Um, so, so, so no, I, I definitely agree that reuse is a great idea whenever you can. And I mentioned the refillable bottles, right, on, on purpose. I mean, that, that is an outstanding example um, of, of reuse. It's been done at large scale, at least in one country, for decades. And I don't, you know, there are cases where that is the, where that approach is eminently viable and we should adopt it. And there are instances where it's extremely challenging and we should think about what materials are most appropriate in situations where they can't be reused, right? Um, Single-use plastics, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, I, I often sort of sit on both sides of the fence on that. Um, I definitely think that they are a problem. The issue that I have is I'm not sure that we have a very good replacement at the moment. And we need to have a good idea of what we want to replace them with before we institute a ban. Um, I always go back to the example of the plastic straws in London, and we decided we were going to replace them, which gives you two options, metal or paper. I'm your yeah, I, Well, okay. <laughs> Assuming we're going to use straws. But uh, um, paper, if you take paper bags versus plastic bags, right? paper is more polluting to make than plastic. So we've traded one form of pollution for another. Some people might think that's a good trade-off, but air pollution versus water pollution, I don't know. Um, pick your poison, literally. Metals means more mining. Do we want more mining, drilling holes in the ground and dumping acid into them to get more metals out? Also a big environmental problem. Um, and so I think by and large, we need to be sure before we institute something as, as heavy-handed, in my opinion, as heavy-handed as a ban, as an outright ban, that we have a replacement that we can all agree is better. Otherwise, we will trade one problem for potentially a worse one. And that, I think, would be a mistake. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. I, I think it's exactly that. I, I do think, uh, unfortunately, plastic has gone a bit of a bad light these days. Uh, but in large, yeah, I do think plastics are fantastic for, for a lot of applications. There is nothing better. Uh, I'd even go as far as to say that that sort of negative view of plastic has made things worse. Uh, the number of packages that I've seen move from plastic packaging to, to paper packaging or paper with a small PLA layer inside, which is now not recycled or not recyclable, yet viewed by the consumer as sort of this wonderful thing, paper-based, because it's not plastic, um, can actually set us back in, in, uh, in sort of recycling rates. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think we need to be careful that we we don't take everyone along. And if you 
reduce. So you, what I think the, the important part is to not reduce the quality of life and the enjoyment of people. I think we've seen that in the discussion with climate change and global warming, that when people say, you know, degrowth or, um, you know, we, we have to use less, then people will not be on board. They will say, I, I want to drive my car. And what in the end will now happen is that we're developing new technologies and approaches that we can st keep our way of life and bring people, you know, plastic is also is convenient. And there are still people, um, um, populations in the world that will use more plastic, that's why it's uh, you know, increasing, um, because they don't have access. And we need to make sure that we, you know, we don't trade it off, we're increasing poverty or we're reducing people's quality of life. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that I think it's a trade-off. So I think we need to not just reduce. Um, I'm sure we're overusing plastics in some areas and it's sensible and there will be better solutions for reusing. But I think there's areas where plastic is absolutely the material to use, and we just need to make sure that we're managing it wisely. Just to add to your wonderful chart, which I think you could have made even more scary because it, it wasn't to scale the bottom axis and then just showed how <laughs> steep the actual rise was. Um, but by 2050, our, our use of plastics is actually going to triple. Uh, so as much as we're using, you know, we're not using our straw, straws or using our reusable, I'm sure Imperial probably has one, you know, loads of water fountains. Um, it, yeah, it's not going to decrease. It's increasing massively. Uh, and that's simply because the developing world wants to live to the standards we live to, live to today. Um, and so, yeah, I think we need to be considering a world where the plastics are going to be here for a very long time. I mean, just look at this room. I'm touching a plastic mic. This is plastic. There's probably plastic and polyester here. We've got PVC here. Literally everything you touch. I think somebody did an interesting study the other, that I read the other day. It's something like two-thirds of all the items you touch during your day are plastic. Um, and, and so, yeah, I don't think we can do without them. And so just finding ways we can uh, recycle them better. Um, we have one question over there. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, she was first, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Claire. Go next, sorry. There you are. Thank you. Um, a question on <clears throat> toxicity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, do you think that we need to change the way that we develop new materials? Um, or how can we change the way we develop new materials to avoid unintended consequences um, of, of a material so we could go for functionality, for example, and end up with toxic materials? What can we do? To, to reduce the occurrence of this, because that's kind of a story of humanity over the past uh, few hundred years. Yeah, I, I, personally, I, I think the answer. Well, I think the answer is probably yes, but it, it's a it's a it's a rather cynical viewpoint, right? It, it, in part, I think it's because we can't control ourselves. So it is, to a large extent, an admission that we can't control what we do with our waste material, um, and so make it as safe as possible. I don't think that there's any. Again, I don't think that there's a, back to the. There's no reason to make something that's not recyclable on purpose. I don't think, think there's also no reason to make something that's toxic unless you absolutely have to have it. And so, finding less toxic alternatives is always a good idea. Um, how we incentivize that, I think, is the big question. So, how do you drive that change? How do you make that sort of the the first item or the second item on the list when somebody's considering a, a new material? Um, I think that's a better question. And back to the discussion about <laughs> different materials. How do you balance our other objectives? Um, and the big one, of course, at the moment, of, is always carbon footprint. And so are we willing to trade off a higher carbon footprint for a lower toxicity? Um, I personally would say I'd, I'd rather have things be less toxic and, and, and emit more CO2. But not everybody feels that way. Um, I have a comment on anticip you know, anticipating. So I think so some things we can probably anticipate, but I think also the world is so complex that we will, there will always be something that we just can't think of it, right? It's non-linear. Mm -hmm. It's just some things coming together. So in order to... So I think there will be an unintended con consequences in the future, future technologies. What we can maybe try to do is to be very flexible and have early detection systems. So for example... Um, there's a movement at the moment to um, set up an intergovernmental uh, panel com commission for uh, chemical pollution. Mm -hmm. And that basically what they're going to do is 
rather than have one you know, on plastic pollution. Uh, so it's sort of, it looks at any sort of pollution that comes from chemicals. And that panel will set the themes and it will sort of ask for input. And so the topic and the focus will shift. And I think that will be really useful so that it doesn't build up so that you know, when you see that curve going up, that panel already sort of puts it on the agenda and we start discussing the problem and um, thinking about solutions. So maybe earlier detection rather than thinking we can anticipate everything at an early stage when, you know, when academics are researching in the lab. We have another question here at the front. Hi, um, Jason mainly. Uh, I'm a chemist and I've been working in the waste sector for the last four decades. So I've seen enormous change. So many questions. But the question that, that I'm going to ask is principally about, the, you're, you're talking about additives and its problems in mechanical recycling. What about chemical recycling? Is that not the silver bullet? It's not a silver bullet. No, I, I, I think I think that's I think that's I don't think that's a very controversial opinion. It's it's not a silver bullet. You, with some additives, you'll still have to deal with them. Um, so so I work. I have, a, I have a spin out company that recycles textiles. We, we recycle the dyes. So literally, our our uh, in, input into there was to try to do the decolorization. Um, mechanical recycling with um, dyed material is virtually impossible, as I said in the talk. It, Victor nicely converted. He even gave the, the, the same numbers that we use, right? Somewhere between two and five times more valuable um, if, it's, if it's transparent PET. Chemical recycling, of course, the recycling part works fine with the dyes because you take the material apart and the dyes just sit there. But <laughs> you've now created an enormous uh, uh, wastewater or waste something stream that's dyed. So we're back to the problem that we have with the dyes upstream. It's smaller, but... Um, this is typically what you see in chemical recycling. You, you have to re either, if the additives survive the chemical recycling process, then you've got to figure out how to clean them up from your waste stream. If they don't survive the chemical recycling process, in some cases it's even worse. So they can ruin the product, co-crystallize, for instance. Um, if we are to adopt large-scale chemical recycling, I think it would make a lot of sense to design our additives such that they, I don't want to say don't interfere with that, but uh, you, you know, we know what they're going to do in the chemical recycling process. All of that said, I do research on chemical recycling. A lot of people do research on chemical recycling because it's still mostly a research topic. I mean, it's starting to make its way up through the TRLs, but at the moment when we talk about commercial recycling, it is mechanical uh, in one form or another. Um, it is an opportunity for the future for us to be smarter for once? I hope we are. I have a question over there. Oh, right, okay. Um, yes, so uh, my name's Michael Worst. I uh, work for an organization called ChemTrust who work on chemicals policy and regulation, environmental policy, uh, mainly at U EU level, but also UK level. So, and we did produce a commission report on chemical recycling a few years ago, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I think that there's a lot of this is about chemicals and what is, I think the reality of regulation um, is such an important issue. I mean, we, we do the EU, the UK is not going to move ahead. It moved ahead on plastic milk bottles, which was good with wrap and all that sort of thing. But, you know, they, they come from two ends. They come from the sort of substance specific end and they come from certain types of applications. So plastic food contact materials are regulated. There's an approved list of additives. It's not very effective. It hasn't been modernized, but it does exist. As soon as you move away from plastic, you don't have that. And as soon as you move away from food contact materials, you don't have it. And it's all about human health as well, uh, not even environmental impacts in more in chemical sense. Or you have packaging regulations, where, the, again, the focus is on recycling and reuse. They're being revised now at EU level but there's not that much about chemicals. So you end up with, so the material type stuff or the use type stuff doesn't have that much in it. And then the chemicals itself is mainly reached, the EU chemicals law. And the assumption really is you're allowed to use something unless there's a good reason from a risk assessment point of view why you shouldn't. And so there's a lack of data. You have, there is an attempt to do more grouping. We're pushing that as ChemTrust. 
the chemical agency is producing these very detailed grouping reports on different sorts of chemicals. Their aim is to get through uh, 27,000 or so substances in these reports, and they're a good way through it. So you get these reports, and bisphenol A was mentioned. You've got bisphenol S, which is very similar and has been replacing bisphenol A. You have bisphenol AF, Z. We did a report on that a few years ago as well. Um, but it's very difficult to move from a theoretical saying these are all in this group to an actual legal control because you can say it doesn't make any sense for a producer to produce a toxic chemical, but it does if that's the chemical you've got your plant set up for and you've got your patents in. And it's the chemical that's the cheapest because it's been produced for 30 or 40 or 50 years, whereas the new one is going to be more expensive. So we have this situation in chemical regulation where the regulation is the thing that forces the improvement by getting rid of the cheap products. But actually getting the activity in regulation is really difficult. And I think your report's very interesting in terms of saying these are, these are ways that it could be done. But the experience that you see in chemical regulation is that things like simplification only really happen if you actually say, right, if you're going to use a chemical as a biocide or a pharmaceutical, you must spend this money through this elaborate process, and then at the end. And that simplifies. And the plastic food contact did that to an extent as well. But it's like if you don't have that hurdle, the expense hurdle, there's not really anything driving simplification in the general sense across the market. So regulation is really important, but the question is, and I suppose the question to the panel is, how do you actually get the regulator to be active enough against all the vested interests who will say, well, we're doing fine in this current situation? Um, so the question is, is a good point. The question is whether that sort of re whether there's other ways of um, forcing the simplification. And the example is when we were talking to supermarkets is that because um, they have a is it the UK government that basically legislated that they need to increase their recycling content. So that's not telling them which material they need to use um, and how mu uh, you know like sort of like yeah of what the additives are, they just said you need to recycle more and they then responded with simplification of the packaging. So maybe thinking of these sort of indirect ways um, that is easier and that sort of forces a more organic um, development maybe as well so that they just, with their purchase, you know, the plastic packaging buyer uh, preferably purchase the, 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 the good formulations. I don't know to how far you can push that, and obviously the big supermarkets, for example, don't cover all of all of the products there. And so I, I'm I'm a bit worried about you know the smaller volumes um, that aren't sort of um, controlled by the big entities that have a high value in their brand, for example. But yeah, if you can, for example, you know, dictating just you have to recycle and you don't, that maybe that will help. That's indirectly with simplification. It's a tough one. It's a good point. I, I, the analogy I would say, I, I often say that the biggest threat to new technology is steel on the ground. I mean, there's nothing you can do about existing infrastructure. It's very expensive to build up a new alternative. And so, yes, a chemical plant that's running will always be more cost efficient than a new one um, because the money's already spent. It's a sunk cost. Um, I think Aggie's probably right. There's going to have to be an indirect lever on this because otherwise you will get into a situation with endless unintended consequences and so we do have to be a bit careful about over uh, over let's not say over regulating because that's that's a that's a different issue over specifying i guess what needs to be done otherwise we'll get to a situation where we don't we, we choke off um new technologies or new products that are coming through the pipeline because they haven't been um, envisaged by this regulation and we don't want to stop something better from displacing the current products just because we want to limit what we think are the good current products. And so that is a, a balance we have to strike that we, uh, we, we don't sort of shoot ourselves in the foot with it. It's a great um, question. I have, to say. we have a question here. Hi, nice to meet you guys. My name is Hamza. I'm a medical student at Barts in London. So my question, um, I guess, could be an extension of the previous question. Uh, it's about why um, are chemicals not uh, undergoing their toxicity reports before being put into production? 
why are they being tested afterwards? And what might be the barriers to doing tests pre-production? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I mean, in the, in the EU at the moment, and in the UK at the moment, um, any, anything that you make more than, I think it's one ton per year, I believe, you have to reach certain, well, actually, okay, I, I do know. So anything that's above one ton per year in production, you have to hit certain, you have to measure certain uh, human health, ecotoxicity, biodegradability. You have to run all of these different tests before you can increase production past one ton of that chemical per year. And then it's, I think it's 50 tons. There's another set of tests that you have to run on and on. I think the last level is 1,000 tons. Um, and then above that, of course, that's sort of everything we could think of. Um, below one ton, we, at the moment, are not regulating, um, or at least not regulating beyond the, the more general regulations. We're not specifically regulating individual compounds below that level, to my knowledge. Um, the reason that we don't is the cost issue. So those tests are extraordinarily expensive. They start the first levels at about a million pounds. And so a producer who's making 50 kilograms of something couldn't possibly afford to pass it through that regulation. Um, I don't know how to square that circle. So I don't, know, I don't know how to, I don't know how one would require the same level of, I guess, comfort with a chemical that's being produced at a low level um, without just eliminating the possibility of it being produced at all. And then we're back to being stuck with whatever's there right now. And we can, we can never innovate even for good. Um, so I, I think that sort of legislation, I think that was reach, right? Um, yeah, that, yeah um, that, so that's already in place and I think it's working. I think other places in the world need to catch up and so I think there needs to be a global level reach uh, type regulation. Um, it doesn't address right the issue that we have with re recyclability. So you could have 100 additives that are non-toxic uh, and maybe even sort of biodegradable, but maybe that would still cause issues with the recycling and um, because they're not compatible when they're mixed together. So I think that's why our recommendation goes beyond that. It, it's not just the chemical itself, it's how it impacts our recycling and the circular economy. Can we have one question here? The judge has been waiting for a while. I'll get the microphone, no worries. Um, just while you're doing that, Jose, I've got yes. one online that I will put to the panel on their behalf. This is from Jane Monk. Um, increasingly, plastic bottles are labeled with claims of 100% recycled content. Is that technically feasible and how can it be verified? Um, and what about the hazardous chemicals in recycled plastics? Although the second half, Jason touched on already, so the first half perhaps. And we have some brands as, con as customers, so I can't necessarily uh, speak as I see, uh, as I like on this topic. Um, but yeah, I've started a little collection on my phone of, of all these types of claims of you know, super recyclability on, on bottles. And yes, I, I do think there's a huge amount of greenwashing um, from, you know, these types of labels to, to the hundreds of different types of recycling symbols and logos that are God knows where they get them from. Um, some are absolute, are there for a reason. Um, but yeah, there's just, it, it's, I guess that's also an area that's just not really regulated. So I, my guess is probably no on the 100. Uh, and then the, the worst one I think is also the one that says 100% recyclable. <laughs> when, yes, Everything is 100% recyclable. It's just not everything is economically recyclable. And that's obviously a big difference. And I've seen the worst type of like multi-layer packaging being said recyclable. I'm sh sure that in Jason's lab, he could sort of peel layer by layer and recycle it, but it's not going to happen. I think Victor is 100% correct <laughs> <laughs> on that one, I have to say. Um, and to be clear, what I was saying earlier, you, you could have a product that contained 100% recycled plastic. What we cannot have is all products containing 100% recycled plastic. We'll start with the very simple reason that we use more plastic every year. So we, do, we, we literally would run out. And secondly, as I said earlier, um, it, it is considered an estimated upper limit that only 85% of plastic even could be recycled. So there is there's an upper limit on what we can do anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, Victor's right. I mean, people put all sorts of things on labels and if you read it carefully, Sometimes it doesn't mean what you think it means. 
and in other cases, possibly some things are less than 100% truthful about their claims? If I can just add to that, there is one good thing out of that, and it is that all the biggest FMCGs in the world have set themselves incredible targets in terms of the amount of recycled plastic they want to hit. Not a single one will hit them. Uh, I think on average, if you take Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, more or less they're all aiming like 30% recycled plastic use by 2025. I mean, they all set these targets a few years back. Um, but yeah, we're at 8% globally, and on, you still have some that are 1% or 2%. Uh, I think Coca-Cola is the best one, pr probably at around sort of the 8 or 10%, I'm not sure. Um, but, but the one good thing about that, it does mean that over the past couple of years, the price of recycled plastics has absolutely gone through the roof because those brands are desperate to sort of buy all that material. Uh, and, and that's great for the recycling industry. Um, and for the first time, the price of um, recycled plastic is higher than virgin, even though it's, it's of lower quality. Uh, now, it does mean you then start having cases. Uh, there was a case in China that was recently busted where people had virgin plastic. Uh, polluted it and then sold it as, you know, ocean-bound recycled plastic uh, for, for a higher price. Um, but overall, it is a good thing for the industry that, that the price of recycled plastic is going up. Yeah, yeah I, 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 have to, I, I said this one time in, in an interview, in a radio interview, but uh, we, have to, we have to be careful with mandates sometimes because they can encourage undesirable behavior. And we saw this during the early stages of the COVID pandemic when the um, paper recyclers shut down. In, in Europe, especially in Scandinavia, but a lot of products had to have 30% recycled fiber in them. And so what the paper mills did was they took the paper off the line and then sent it back to the beater. So they basically just recycled it before sending it out. And while that sounds awful, because it is awful, they actually had to do it because otherwise they couldn't sell the product because the recycling stream was offline. Temporarily, so we need to make sure that we don't say, "Okay, we have to have 100. We have to have 70 percent recycled plastic." Well, what that will mean is that Coca-Cola and Pepsi and whatnot probably could pay insane amounts of money, but then nobody else would be able to afford it. And so we need to make sure that we encourage good behavior rather than encouraging people to make plastic and recycle it so that it's recycled without actually using it. That would be. Silly. So we have a question over here. Yeah, hi, I'm Gérard Laroux, reader in Different Life Sciences. My question might be naive because I'm not in this topic, but basically we, I feel that we speak about the additive we know, but I guess in one year, in the next week, there will be new additive coming into the market, and we don't know maybe how to recycle those, and I feel it's like an endless discussion where we might have the solution for the one we know now, but the one we do in the future, we don't know, and we will fall back into the same situation in five, ten years where we have a new additive or plastic material, but we don't know how to recycle those. And so what are your views about this uh, endless situation and biodegradable uh, additive and how they can be uh, implemented and the proportion you see in, in a particular uh, market point of view and, uh, and for academics for the implementation to replace uh, those uh, chemical additives? Thank you. Um. I think my view on the biodegradable ones is, what it, in my view, we shouldn't have them in, in Europe, uh, or for household waste packaging. And by that, I mean most of our packaging doesn't end up in the environment in Europe. It does get collected. Uh, I mean, it either goes to landfill, to incineration, or to a waste facility. Um, and so putting biodegradable plastics in there is almost giving up. Different story if we talk about countries that don't have that collection infrastructure then yes, absolutely, I do think biodegradable plastics has, has, have a big role into it. Um, the key, I think, is, is partnerships between the producers and the waste facilities and the reprocessors. Uh, so say you have a new additive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want too much regulation on prescribing what's allowed and not allowed. I think the regulation should be much more on does it work in the system or not? Because if it does, yeah, you might have a completely new additive, but if it can be detected in the waste plant with the current machines, great. If it can then use the same reprocessing plants to turn PT from bottle to bottle, or, or then, you know, let's go for it. Um, whilst if there's at any one of those stages it can't work at all, then it's probably not the greatest one. I, I think the challenging one is the leap of, if you do have one that would be an absolute game changer, but does require us to change all of our waste plants, 
yeah, I think that's a bit of a trickier one because maybe it would be an amazing impact, but, but you need to then change everything. I think Victor's right in the short term, and also it makes good business sense usually to try and work with the existing system. Um, additives are a bit difficult. Um, I know with bioplastics of different types, you, you see both both sides of this, right? Uh, PEF. I don't know. I don't know if this is entirely true, but because I haven't tested it myself, but PEF, which is a bio-based alternative to PET, supposedly can be recycled in the PET stream and mixed. They're 100 percent blendable. So if you had five percent or 10% or 20%, you, they would just go together, and it would just sort of slowly blend into the infrastructure, and you don't have to change anything in the recycling infrastructure. I don't know how widely that's been tested, but that, that's uh, one, of, one of the things that has been reported about it. PLA, that's not true at all, and so polylactic acid bottles can't be recycled alongside PET bottles. So with additives, I think we need, in the short term at least, we need to take the approach that we're gonna work within the existing infrastructure I'm sure, I'm sure Victor's right. We never want to avoid the possibility that something is going to be so incredible that it's worth disrupting the entire system for. But in my experience, if things are too disruptive, they just won't happen. Um, you know, the, the, the more disruptive the technology, the more destructive the new product, the new chemical, the higher the barrier to entry it's going to have. Can we take one final question? There was one question on the back. Yep, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Diana, and I'm also from Plastics Rebellion. Um, I have to say, I found this quite a depressing discussion. I feel that the panel is coming at the problem of plastics from completely the wrong perspective. Let me just give a few facts about plastic. It's essentially a fossil fuel. It's, it's made from fracked gas. Recycling needs virgin plastic for the process to happen. So there has to always be an input of virgin plastic, which means we have to keep making plastic. Plastic can only be recycled a few times before the chemical bonds actually break down. And you as chemists, should, I'm sure you're aware of that. So what, what do we do then with all this broken down plastic? Chemical additives are toxic to human health. Nobody's mentioned PFASs, which the endocrine disruptors. You, you will all know about those. They're horrendous. They're, they're having a terrible effect on human life and other life. I don't know how we're even tolerating them. And the levels in this country uh, of toleration are much um, higher than they are in the EU. Let's face it, most plastic is going to be burnt with 8% recycling rate. It's just going to be burnt. And it's essentially an energy from waste raw material. And that's what the plastics industry wants. And that's, they, they like that because they can... They, fossil fuel companies are pivoting away from um, oil and gas because they know that's, they're going to have to reduce that. But then they, they've um, spotted an, a, a get-out-of-jail card in plastic. So um, it's not really a question, I suppose. I'm just, I'm just sort of ex explaining <laughs> why I feel so depressed about plastic. Um, we, I, I think you're coming at the whole thing from the wrong perspective. I feel you're too complacent and just tolerating this amount of plastic and you just want to so, try and kind of just slightly ameliorate things. Um, when I think really you should be recommending to the government, um, as the EU is currently consulting on, um, to recommend reduction and refill and reuse systems. Um, that, that's really the only way to go. And I, I know that one of you mentioned that you know, we can't limit people's enjoyment of life. Well, you know, I, I don't think sort of having your child's endocrine system um, disrupted is actually, uh, uh, you know, something to be enjoyed. Plastic might have a lot of advantages and, um, you, know, you know, there might be lots of wonderful things about plastic. Yes, it is a wonderful material, but generally when things are too good to be true, you know, they're, they're, they're terrible. And um, it, it's coming, coming back to haunt us. I'm 70. Um, in my childhood, we didn't have plastic. When I was young, plastic appeared when I was about 10 as well. And um, it's, it's all happened in my lifetime. And, and it's horrifying, it's absolutely terrifying to think that people in, in the global south are burning these tiny individual sachets over fires to cook their food. Uh, I mean, what have we come to? 
I don't know why you scientists aren't really shouting about the plastic problem instead of just going along with it. Actually, yeah, I don't think, um, I have, think I have to disagree with that. I mean, no one here is going along with that. What, the first recommendation of the briefing paper is actually to reduce the number and the families of additives used. Um, so I'm sorry if it came as complacent, but I don't think it was actually the case. Uh, what they were trying to say, uh, if I understood correctly, that sometimes by solving a problem, you shouldn't try to create an, another one that is even worse. Yeah, but that was the first recommendation. Uh, I'd love to, to give the other for, for compensating for all the doom and gloom. Uh, I do think there is there have been wonderful things about plastic, as, as controversial as, as it sounds. The, the, the first plastic was actually invented uh, to replace um, billiard balls in Chicago. Uh, billiard was used to make from ivory. Uh, it was killing hundreds of elephants, and it's actually a company that put an ad for $10,000. Somebody could essentially come up with some replacement to that shell-like material, and that's how cellulose uh, was invented after a few years. Um, that single invention probably saved elephants from extinction, because before we would make, essentially, we didn't have plastic, so the only material that was sort of flexible enough to, to be sort of polished so accurately was, was elephant horns. Uh, then came Bakelite, the, the second uh, plastic, uh, that was able to replace uh, Sheliac that people used to, to have, and, and other horns, that, that was really, at the time, the only material that could fit the properties of sort of small, delicate structures while it's being affordable. Um, come World War II, you have a massive expansion in the amount of plastic used in the Second World War. Obviously not great, uh, but when the war ends, uh, all that production capacity is there, and, and it gets redirected into building, you know, essentially the consumer society we, we obviously have today. Uh, but it has significantly improved the lifestyle of millions of people. Suddenly everybody has a washing machine, suddenly everyone has a car, um, and, and bit by bit, you know, that keeps going on, uh, where plastic has lifted millions of people out of poverty, means that we can all have much better material wealth and, and live better lives. You know, again, look in this room, like half the stuff has some plastic element, it, your paint has plastic elements it, in, in pretty much everything. And, and then I do, yes, I, I absolutely agree with you that that last phase uh, of plastic, when we've become so good at producing them and mass producing them, which means we start using it in everything and, and sort of mass production. Um, and I absolutely agree with everything you've said on the fact that, yeah, like plastic bottles, today just PET bottles, in one year, if you were to line them up in one line from one end to the other, it would take you one year to travel from one end to the other if you were traveling in a fighter jet at 1,000 kilometers an hour. And that we do every year. And that's just PET bottles. You know, to that, you've got to add all the other stuff. Um, but today there isn't a better solution. Uh, there's, I, I agree, we can sort of do refillable bottles, uh, but if you go in the global south, you know, the tap water isn't always accessible, uh, so people do need a cheap, and, a cheap way to, to sort of quickly get access to water. Um, I, I think another problem, and, and it's a bit economical, it's true in, in, in the south, we, you mentioned all the small plastic pouches uh, the big brands are producing, uh, which, is, which is a shame, because instead of selling big bottles, uh, that have less plastics and, and more content. Uh, a lot of brands now sell loads of smaller bottles because they're, they're more affordable, but I guess that's the balance between people being able to buy that product and, and having a comfortable lifestyle versus not buying it and using less plastics. And yeah, it's more of an economic and, and political debate. I maybe comment on, on your sentiment. So I, when we realize that there's a problem, I think going into a sort of depression or being outraged about it is part of the process. I do think we will, you know, we need to then move on and develop an action plan. And I think we, for example, this is this is an idea um, and a suggestion for a solution. So we absolutely don't, not sitting here and saying that there's not a problem. We're trying to suggest a solution that is equitable, that doesn't take away from people. I firmly believe, even though I don't have answers, that we will work it out together. Um, and it's not only one person, and it's not only scientists. We have to work together with policy, with industry. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I think I can, we can do it. Sustainable, sustainability is meeting the needs of the present generation uh, without compromising the needs of the future generations. And so we have to, we have to live our life while also thinking about the future. But we, 
I don't think you can take people along when you just tell them that it's all terrible and they have to go back to 60 years ago. I, I think there's a lot of people that don't want to go back to 60 years ago for various reasons. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I think it's time to uh, wrap um, the presentation up. Um, I wanted to finish by thanking all for the questions. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. Thanks, everyone, for attending today in person, also online. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the authors of the briefing paper who were in present today, Arturo Castillo, Castillo, Kieran Brophy, and Isabella von Holstein, who's in the audience. Uh, thanks as well the authors of the policy report that we have on the panel, Jason Halle, Aggie Brand Talbot, and Isabella von Holstein. Uh, thanks our panelists for taking the questions. And uh, thanks to everyone that has made this event possible, the AV team, the catering team, and of course the MC team. Um, for those of you that want to stay, please feel free to join us. So we will have a networking and drinks reception now in the foyer. With this, thanks very much for coming today.